Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. Thank you because it is your will that we hear from you. And we're praying tonight that your spirit will take the word out of the reaching page and write it upon the tables of our hearts in Jesus' name. Give us understanding as we study. And we're praying, O oh Lord, that the study will prepare us to meet you on that final day when the last trumpet shall sound in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that whatever you need to do in any heart, in any life, will grant you the chance to do it so that you'll prepare us and will meet with you in peace on that final day in Jesus' name. Explain your word to us. Make us to understand. And whatever confusion may be in any heart concerning whatever we're going to read, we pray, Lord, that light from heaven will shine upon the word so that we will understand. And the grace to abide by what you are teaching us, you give to every one of us. Bless us in the study of your word. Strengthen us. For the entrance of your word that brings light. In Jesus' name we pray. At present we are in a study of the Bible. And we are in the book of prophet Joel. And we started just a few weeks ago. And right now we are in study three. And in our third study we are looking at Joel chapter two. Reading from verse 1 to verse 2 and to verse 3. But before we do that, I want to tell you that this prophecy of Joel actually covers a long period of time. As you look at the book itself, just three chapters. But then in these three chapters and just a few verses, we have quite a lot that the Spirit of God is revealing. He revealed to the people at that time, the time of Joel. And to the people that followed after that time. And even till this very time, the book of Joel is still very relevant. Not only at this time, till the very end of time. You are going to discover that the prophecy of the book of Joel is very relevant. He wrote uh, the prophecy about uh, more than 700 years before Christ. And he was looking forward to the many things that were going to happen. One that will happen to the people of Judah. Two, that will happen after Christ had come. Three, that will happen to the church age, at the close of the church age. Four, that will happen when the church has been raptured, taken away, and there will be a great tribulation. Five, he looked at the things that will also happen at the time when Christ will come, at the beginning of wanting to set up his millennial reign. That is the battle of Armageddon 6. He also tells us what will happen at the time of the millennium. So, the prophecy of Joel actually stretches for a very long time. And it's a long journey in a very short book. Look at Joel chapter 1. In Joel chapter 1, looking at it from verse 6. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has, he has the cheek of uh, the cheek teeth of a great lion. There he is talking about the Assyrians and the Babylonians that will come upon the people of Judah and take them away to captivity. He was actually talking about something that will happen about a hundred years after he had written the prophecy. And then, if that uh, prophecy concerns the time before Christ, how about after Christ had come? And after he had established the church, after he had gone away, and the disciples asked him, will you at this time bring the kingdom back to Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the time, the season, or the epoch that God has put in his own hand. But you wait in Jerusalem, because you receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, and Jerusalem to you, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Do you know Joel spoke about that? Joel chapter 2. 
and in verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. There he was talking about the Pentecost that will come. But he didn't only really speak about that. He looked beyond that. You see that at the beginning of the church age. The outpouring of the Spirit of God. But then he moves also unto the final time, which is uh, the end of the church age in Joel chapter 2. Reading from verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. If you compare those verses I just read to you now with what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, you will see that he was talking about after the tribulation of those days, then shall the sun be darkened and the moon be turned to blood. And then he goes on telling us what's going to happen at uh, the time of the great tribulation and the end of the great tribulation. But you know, Joel did not even stop there. Joel continued in Joel chapter 3. As uh, so you come to Joel chapter 3, it's not going beyond the time of the great tribulation. And it's getting to the time of, the, of Armageddon now. That is, at the time just before the Lord Almighty will send a redeemer, send him back again before he establishes the great uh, uh, millennial reign. In uh, Joel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 9. Be proclaim ye days among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come. All ye heathen, Gentiles, unbelievers, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord, and let the heathen be waking and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I seek to judge all the heathen round about. You will see there that it's talking about uh, the time when the war will come. That's the Armageddon. And it, it's after that that the Lord Jesus will set up the millennial reign. And didn't Joel know about that too? He tells us in Joel, look at it, chapter 3, verse 16, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. In verse 18, and it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with water and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. In verse 20, but Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. And so you will see the span of the long period that the prophecy of Joel actually covers. It's a very important book to the Lord himself, an important book to the church, and it, it befits the church to really study what you have in the book of Joel today. We come to Joel chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. And uh, it's the great and terrible day of the Lord. The great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh, please open your uh, Bible to Joel chapter 2 now, reading from verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is near at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as 
the morning spread upon the mountains a great people and a strong. There has not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it. Even to the years of many generations, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. And there you will see that Joel the prophet was talking about a very important concept, and the concept is the day of the Lord. And many people do not understand when it says the day of the Lord. And that's the reason why we need to study. In fact, you cannot read the book of Joel without wanting to understand this concept, the day of the Lord. Because he mentions it actually quite a number of times. In chapter 1, in verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And then you've seen it, he mentioned it in verse in chapter 2 and in verse 1. He tells us, For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is near at hand. And in chapter 2, it still goes on and it still keeps on mentioning the day of the Lord in verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. If he mentions this day of the Lord, so many times there must be a reason and what is this the significance of this day of the lord actually when he talked about the day of the lord he was using that word or those words in a technical way and it's an eschatological kind of expression he's talking about the time when the lord will come back in flaming fury and the anger of god will be unleashed upon all sinners in the world it's actually a future day eschatological day of devastation and doom and damnation and destruction is the day of God's vengeance. Actually, it's not just a 24-hour day. It's a period. It's like telling us man has had its own day. The day of probation and the day of trial and the day of freedom and the day of serving God if they wanted to serve God, or the day of rejecting God, the day of liberty, the day of man, when man could make a choice, what he wanted to do, what he didn't want to do. Now God says, man, mankind, your day is over. It remains now my day. And when God comes and he establishes his own day, all that man has done in man's day, Almighty God, in the day of the Lord, will bring into account, will judge. So, and that's the concept here of the day of the Lord. And in those three verses, we're going to look at three things. Number one, the description of the day of the Lord. And you will see it in Joel. You'll see it in other Old Testament prophets. And you'll see it also as you come to the New Testament. The day of the Lord. The description of that day. The description of that period. The things that will be happening at that period of time. But then, uh, as uh, students of the Bible, you need to distinguish, make a difference between the day of the Lord and the day of our Lord. Actually, as we come to the New Testament, there's the day of Christ. Different. The day of Jesus Christ. Different. The day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Different. And so, a Bible student must make the distinction, the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, number three, destruction during the day of the Lord. Destruction during the day of the Lord. Come on to number one, the description of the day of the Lord. As we come to Joel chapter 2. I read to you from verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Stop there for a moment. The children of Israel, whenever they wanted to go to war, there was something they did. They blew the trumpet to arouse everyone, summon everyone, gather everyone together. Blow ye the trumpet. Not only that, whenever they wanted to alert them, warn them of a coming danger, what the children of Israel will do, they had a watchman. On the tower 
and the watchman will blow the trumpet. That's why Ezekiel said, when the watchman blows that trumpet, whoever does not take heed and is lost in that battle, the fault will be his, his blood will be upon himself. And now Joel wanted to announce the coming devastation and the coming destruction and the coming doom. And the things that will happen in the world in which we live, even though it was still future. And he wanted them to prepare. Prepare to meet the Lord thy God. How did he do that? To jolt them, make them alert, make them to wake up, blow the trumpet. Do it in Zion. Where is Zion? Zion is where Psalm 2 says, In Zion, my holy mountain. That's where the Lord has put his glory. That's where the Lord has put the headquarters of the children of Israel in Jerusalem at that time. And he said, at that headquarters, where the people of God gather, it's at that place you have to blow the trumpet, sound an alarm. In my holy mountain, he's still saying the same thing, Zion, my holy mountain, the same place. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. He says, at this time, the things that will be coming, it will be a time when God will bring every man into account. What you have done in the flesh. All the lives you have lived. Therefore, let all men, all the inhabitants of the land, let them tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. It is near at hand. You understand? When it says it's near at hand. In God's own account, something might be 2,000 years away. Something might be 3,000, 4,000 years away in the, in the time of the Lord. It's near at hand. After all, a thousand years of the Lord is like one day. That's why when John the Baptist came, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that kingdom was still thousands of years away when Christ will establish that millennial reign. And yet, it's at hand. Very close at the door. That's the language that Joel is using here. And then he goes on now to give us a description of the things that will be happening on that day. A day of darkness and a day of gloominess and a day of clouds and a day of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. Then he says, a great people and a strong. There, shall, there has not been ever the like. Neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. He was telling them that it was going to be a time of suffering for the children of Israel. It was still future. And when you fill in all that you study with all the other, all the other things that the prophets have written, you will know, you know the reason why. Because the children of Israel will reject their Messiah. The children of Israel, they will reject the mercy of God. A final day then will come when all the period of probation, all the time of liberty will be over. And then the Lord will bring them to judgment. That's why it says it's going to be a time when people are going to suffer. That's those who reject Christ. In verse 3, a fire devoureth before them. And behind them, a flame burneth. The land is at, it's like the garden of Eden before them, before they came there, those armies. Before they got there, it says, before the suffering comes, it's like the Garden of Eden. And behind them, after they have passed through, it will be a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. As we look at uh, this uh, day of the Lord, and the way the, uh, the Bible describes it, uh, you understand what he's saying. Come to you, chapter 1, verse 15. Alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Very close by in the account of God. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. So uh, when you read about this day of the Lord, as a believer, you'll not say, yes, I'm waiting for that day. I want the day of the Lord to come. And I want to partake in that day. No, you don't want to partake in this. This one is different. Because as a destruction, it will come from the hand of the Almighty. In Joel chapter 2, verse 11. And the Lord shall alter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And the question is, who can abide it? 
that is, uh, the, the punishment that will come upon the people of the world because of their sins will be so great that the stoutest of men, the strongest of men, uh, will, will really crumble under the mighty hand of God because of the judgment that will come. In verse 30, it tells us, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. That is, it's going to be such a terrible time, such a difficult time. And there will be wonders, wonders in the sky, wonders in the firmament, wonders in the heavens. And then it says, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And just uh, uh, put your finger in Joel and come on to Matthew. And please uh, hold in your mind what we just read now. What will happen to the sun? What will happen to the moon? What will happen in the skies? When the day of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the Lord, when that day comes. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, uh, you, you know what Jesus was talking about? He was talking about the great tribulation already. He, he spoke about the precursors of the, uh, of the great tribulation. That he is uh, the things that will be happening before that time. Because his disciples asked him, tell us, what shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he began to tell them uh, the many, many things that will happen. And then he goes on now in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken then in verse 30 shall appear the son of the son of a sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory do you see that he's talking about that same thing that joel had spoken about that is the coming day of the Lord, and it's he said it's going to be a terrible, terrible time in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Peter just receiving the Holy Spirit together with uh, the rest uh, 119, making 120 of all of them. As he began to speak, he quoted Joel. And then he still told the people, reminded them, this is man's day, man's day of blessing, man's day of repentance, man's day of living a life uh, that's according to the word of the Lord. But man's day will not be forever and ever. Man's day will end and the day of the Lord will come. And that is the day when the Lord will, will take authority to himself because authority and power and might belongs to him. And then he will judge all things and it's going to be terrible on the people that do not know the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Uh, you see that he is still talking about the same thing. Uh, come back to Joel in Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Now from verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Uh, now, now you see here, uh, this is verse 14. Many evangelists will quote it and say, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. This is the day of the Lord. Decide for the Lord now. Multitudes, come unto the Lord. Well, it may sound good when evangelists say that, but that's not what he's talking about. Come back to verse 9. Proclaim ye among the Gentiles. You Gentiles, your days are over. You Gentiles, the period of probation. And the period of liberty, all that is over, prepare war. Wake up, the mighty men. It's the Lord Almighty talking. 
uh, to the Gentiles, you have been rebelling against the will of the Lord and the plan of the Lord, and uh, you have been rebelling against his call. He's been calling you to himself into salvation and fellowship. You have rejected. All right, now prepare for war. Wake up, your mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. That is, uh, the Lord was telling them in this battle, you don't have enough swords. You want to fight against the Lord. He was telling them, your plowshares, what you are using to gather and to reap your harvest, convert them, transform them into swords because this fight is going to be a great thing. And you're pruning hooks into spears. He was telling them, all the instruments you have been using for harvesting, turn them into spears, weapons of war. Let the weak say, I am strong. That is, you don't let the army of the Lord outnumber your army. He wake up the mighty men. And even the weak people among those Gentile nations who have rejected the Lord, encourage them, summon them up, and tell them, let the weak say, I am strong. You know, when you, when you just uh, talk and when you just quote the Bible, you say, I am weak. Let the weak say, I am strong. But that's not what this is talking about. Then it says, assemble yourselves and come. All ye heathen. It's not talking to you, a believer, actually. Uh, the believers who have gone in the rapture before this great and terrible, notable day of the Lord. It's talking to the heathen. And it says, gather yourselves together, round about. See the cause thy mighty ones to come down. O oh Lord, it says now when the Gentiles are gathered, when the heathens are gathered, when the uh, people that have rejected Christ and rejected the love of God and the mercy of God, when they are gathered, now, O oh Lord, the Gentiles have gathered, they are here waiting for you, and they want to fight against your supremacy. Let the mighty ones come down now, O oh Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the place where that battle of Armageddon will be fought on that final day. For there, there will I see to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full and the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. It's talking about the gentle nations and the people that have rejected the Lord. Their wickedness is great and there are so many of them, multitudes, multitudes of them in this valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the decided place and where the Lord will judge them, which is the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is come. It's near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. And the stars shall withdraw. They are shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, shall tremble. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. You will see then at that notable day of the Lord, which is uh, the time of suffering for the Christ rejectors of the world, is actually a terrible time. So when you read that, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, is talking about the time when the Lord will judge the unbelievers. But what ought to be your attitude? What ought to be my attitude? Seeing that all these things shall be. It's in Second Peter. The Lord is telling us. Second Peter, chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, looking at it from verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the walls that are therein, shall be burnt. You will see the consistency of the Bible. Whether you are reading from the Old Testament or you are reading from the New Testament, the same thing we are being told. That this day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It's a day of devastation. It's, it's a day when God will look at all the records of the gentle people, of the unbelieving people, and he will bring them to account because of what they have done. And then it says, hey, look at it, it says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What that is saying is that it will be sudden, it will be unexpected, it will be unannounced. 
Because in those days, the thieves did not write a note or a letter to the people that they were going to steal from saying, We're coming to your place on Thursday between the hours of 8 and 10. In the evening, get ready, want to loot and take away all that you have. They didn't do that. They came suddenly, unannounced, unexpected. And so it's saying, this terrible day, the day of devastation, the day of destruction, the day of doom, it will come suddenly. It will come unexpected. It will come when the people were not waiting for that day. Didn't the Lord Jesus Christ himself say that? Yes, he said that. If you go back to Matthew, he said, He is coming. The Son of Man will come. And he's going to be as a thief in the night. Because of its suddenness. Because of its unexpectedness. And he says the same thing even in Revelation. Still talking about this thing coming as a thief in the night. Telling us that we who are Christians, we need to prepare so that the day will not come upon us unprepared. Put your finger in Second Peter. I'm still coming back there. In Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. In verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and he see his shame. Uh, what's, uh, what that is saying is, uh, when, when you sleep at night, and then you didn't put on anything, you just had a wrapper to cover yourself, and then the thieves come in the night and order everybody out. And then as you come out, they have stolen everything. And then in the morning, uh, you are roaming about sh with shame, with nakedness. That's what he's saying. That thing in the physical, it says, bring it to the spiritual that he'll be coming as a thief in the night. And you will not know when he will come. Therefore, prepare yourself so that that day will not come upon you unprepared. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It's saying that uh, the world will be so bad that when the Lord comes, the day of the Lord, when man's day is over, the earth, the world, will have been so polluted that God will say he cannot do anything with that earth. So what he will do is just to uh, send fire that will consume everything, the property, the land, and the sea, and everything. Everything will melt away with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burnt up. That's how terrible. That's how devastating. The day of the Lord will be. And then in verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Uh, that's the reason for studying. That's the reason for looking at the word of God, comparing scripture with scripture. That's the reason for looking at all these verses telling us about the day of the Lord. It's easy for us to just string the verses together and string the scriptures together and for you to have it in the head, the day of the Lord in Isaiah, the day of the Lord in Jeremiah, the day of the Lord in Joel, the day of the Lord in Second Peter, the day of the Lord here and there, knowing that man's day will be over and knowing that the day of the Lord will come and knowing that all these things shall be dissolved. Certificates will be burned. Property will be burned. And all the things we're looking at, the things that are drawing many people away from the Lord, all those things will be forgotten, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation? That's what conversation means. Your character, your conduct, your lifestyle. That uh, you need to understand that the, the, the bottom line and the reason, the purpose, the goal of studying all these is that you realize man's day will be over. Man's day of sinning. Man's day of rejecting Christ. Man's day of going his own way. All that day will be over. When that day will be over, God will take over. And it will be the day of the Lord. And everything we're running after, I will forsake Christ. I will forsake salvation. I will lose our salvation because of running after all those things. All those things will be dissolved. What are we going to do then? If we're going to be wise, like the wise virgins preparing for the coming of their Lord, it will be that we go back to Calvary, we go back to the cross, and we have real genuine salvation. We allow the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus to wash us 
wash us whiter than snow. And we then go to the throne of grace to receive grace to overcome every temptation and every trial so that we live a life that will be glorified unto God so that our lives now, for the rest of our time, will be in holy conversation and godliness. And every morning when we wake up, knowing that man's day may be over today, and then God's day may begin today, looking for his name unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved children of God, those who are saved, those who, are, those who want to be uh, taken away in the rapture before the great tribulation will come, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Let's come back to Joel. Uh, we have seen the description of the day of the Lord. Joel's prophecy of the day of the Lord you need to understand, has two faces. A near historical fulfillment on his nation. Because you see, uh, the people of Judah, uh, they didn't know that the Babylonians will come, the Assyrians will come. And so, uh, when you read the prophecies of the Old Testament, you know that uh, there is a near fulfillment. And there is a future fulfillment. The near fulfillment is that uh, the Assyrians will come upon them, the Babylonians will come upon them. But then, there's, uh, there's a final fire future prophetic fulfillment of everything not only on judah but on the whole world that's the ultimate fulfillment in the end time the initial fulfillment is the near historical day of the lord that came upon judah uh, just about 100 years after the prophecy had been spoken now we're waiting for the final future fulfillment now we come to number two the difference in the day of our lord uh, when you read this, uh, you need to be able to divide the scriptures appropriately. Because it says that uh, you'll be a man that's uh, equipped. If you're a teacher of the world, and if you're a, a leader in the church of the living God, uh, you must understand, because it says you're studying, to show yourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, properly, dividing, interpreting, explaining, Applying the word of God. Well then, what's the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Jesus? Or the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or the day of Christ? As, as we come across in the New Testament. I come to a first a Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 1. In first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 and verse 8. And you come across a this. It says in verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you need to understand this is not talking about the day of gloominess. This is not talking about the day of darkness, the day of doom, the day of devastation and destruction. This is talking about the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What day is that? Uh, later, uh, Paul the Apostle will be telling the Corinthian Christians, Behold, I show unto you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we that remain behind, we shall be changed. That's the rapture. And that's the rapture passage I just read to you now. And uh, he was telling the Corinthian Christians, you are not waiting for the great tribulation. You are waiting for the rapture. And if you are waiting for the rapture, then get yourself prepared. It says, now you are born again. Now you are sanctified. Now you are filled with the Holy Ghost. Now you have the gifts of the Spirit so that ye come behind in no spiritual gift. You are now waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the rapture. 
you are waiting for the time when the Lord will come. And he will take his saints home. And then it says, when he comes, he shall confirm you unto the end. He has grace enough. He has strength enough to keep on affirming you and confirming you and helping you and strengthening you. And he will do that till the end so that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the believers are waiting for. And that's what we children of God were praying. That on that day, when the Lord will come, that you will not be missing on that day. And you will not miss out in Jesus' name. The word of God then speaks of the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just read it to you. In other places, it talks about the day of the Lord Jesus. Other places, the day of Jesus Christ. Another place again, the day of Christ. This is different from the day of the Lord. And for the day of Jesus, the day of our Lord Jesus, or the day of Jesus Christ, or the day of Christ, and there's brightness, there's glory, there's joy. Comfort one another with these words. On the other hand, for the day of the Lord, Lord the Lord's day, not Sunday, that is, when man's day is over, and the Lord will come with great, great judgment. There's gloominess and darkness. And there's pain. And there's going to be terrible punishment. The day of Christ is for the believers, for the church. It is the time when the believers will be rewarded by Christ himself. When believers will enter into eternal glory. The day of Christ is associated with the rapture. The final redemption and reward of the saints. On the other hand, the day of the Lord is associated with the final judgment of the ungodly in the world. A come on in your Bible in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And, and that's a beautiful note. And that's not uh, something that brings sorrow, or that brings a gloominess, that brings darkness or destruction. It says, the Lord has begun a good thing in you. You are saved, and you are walking with the Lord, and you are a child of God. He will, if you depend upon him, if you trust him day by day, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that you don't have to be worrying every time, hey, will I not backslide? Will I be able to make it at the time of the rapture? The, the grace is there with the Lord. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, at the middle of the road, I may just faint off and not able to make it on the final day. Yes, you can make it because he can supply all your spiritual needs to make you more than an overcomer, more than a conqueror. If you will keep on depending, trusting in him. In uh, verse 10 of this same chapter, 1 Philippians, that ye may be approved, that ye may approve the things that are excellent. That ye may be sincere without offense until the day of Christ. It says, uh, what the Lord is expecting is that everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself, purifies himself. Every day, uh, you are in the blood of the Lamb. You dip yourself in the blood of the Lamb. Because if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So, he keeps you righteous, and he keeps you holy, and he keeps you blameless until the very day of Christ. That means you come to the Lord by repenting, turning away from your sins, and you bend low at the cross of Calvary. And then you allow the cross of Jesus to cross out and cancel all your sins and all your evil. And you pray in faith that the blood of Jesus will wash you whiter than snow. And then you believe on the Lord. And as you believe on the Lord, the Spirit of God bears witness with your heart that you are a child of God. And now day by day, you read your Bible. Day by day, you put your trust in God. Day by day, you lean upon the everlasting arms. Day by day, you are trusting him. When temptations come, there is no temptation that takes you, overtakes you, that is not common to man. But with that temptation, he will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And then every time you think there is a temptation that wants to pull you back to sin, that is greater than your strength, greater than your experience. 
you know that you can come to the throne of grace and as you come to the throne of grace you receive grace and mercy to help in the time of need so that you're always overcoming your temptation that is how you will by the grace of god approve the things that are excellent and that you'll be able to stay and remain sincere and righteous and holy and godly without offense without any sin until the day of christ when he will come for his own in philippians chapter 2 and in verse 16 philippians chapter 2 i'm reading it from verse from verse uh, 12 wherefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed and you see when we talk about the day of christ or the day of jesus christ we're talking about something comforting to children of God. And here he's talking about the beloved. As you have always obeyed. Not in my presence only. But also much more. Now much more. In my absence. Walk out your own salvation. With fear and trembling. It says as we're moving with the Lord. And we're conducting our lives. We walk out our salvation. The final salvation. You are born again already. You have the salvation of the Lord already. You want to live a righteous life. With fear and and trembling when the devil will bring his temptation uh, for you to go this way or for you to go that way you want to rely upon the lord and then it says as you're walking on that salvation it will be of fear and trembling for it is god who walketh which walketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure do all things without murmurings and disputings as we're getting ready for the day of the of jesus christ for the day of our lord jesus as we're getting ready in another way for the rapture you do all things without murmurings and without disputing that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of god without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world holding forth the watch of life that i may rejoice here is the word in the day of christ Paul the apostle was concerned that the people he had ministered to, the people he had preached to, they will live the consistent life and they will be holding forth the word of life and they will be living a life that is bringing glory to God so that I will know I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. When he sees thousands of people, perhaps millions of people, that his ministry had been able to bring to the Lord, then he will rejoice on that day that he had not labored in vain. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Reading there in verse 5. And you know the story here. And there, there was somebody in the church at Corinth. And that individual committed fornication immorality. And had taken his father's wife. And the church at Corinth had not dealt with that sin. And he had popped up and not rather mourned that, that, he, uh, that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. And then he told them now what to do. That uh, there must be discipline, chastisement. And in fact, they should send out that individual so that he will know the gravity of the offense and the sin he has committed. Now in verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? What it means is that uh, when that fellow is chastised, throw him out of the church, that his uh, body will feel the pain. What pain? Because when he's thrown out of the church, he's out of the protection of the Lord. And then Satan will torment and torture the body, the flesh. That torment and that problem will make him to come to himself like the prodigal son. Then he will say, Didn't, am I not ruining myself? Am I not destroying myself? When I was at home in fellowship with the people of God, Satan could not touch me with all this. Is. I will go back home. And then that fellow will repent. And when he repents, the Lord will forgive him. That forgiveness, eh, now he'll be very careful in his life not to go into such a thing anymore. Then when the Lord will come, in the day of the Lord Jesus, his spirit will be holy and righteous and pure and blameless. And he'll be able to go with the saints when the saints go marching in. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. As also, ye have acknowledged us in part, 
that ye are, we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours, our rejoicing in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul the apostle said, you rejoice when you see us. And we are your rejoicing, you too, because you have received the gospel. You too, because you are accepting the word of God we are preaching unto you. You too, because you are obedient to the word, the gospel that you are hearing. On the day when the Lord will come, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be our rejoicing as well. And let's come back now. We have already made the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of our Lord. The day of the Lord, and that's talking about devastation. That's talking about destruction. The day of our Lord, that is our Lord Jesus Christ. That's talking about the time of the rapture when he will come for his own. Come back to Joel. Uh, we're not looking at the destruction, the devastation, the doom, the darkness that will be during the day of the Lord. And as I told you already, uh, the different uh, passages of the Old Testament actually speak about this. The destruction during the day of the Lord. Um, in chapter 2 again of Joel, reading from verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Wake up the people that are sleeping. Wake up the people that are dull of hearing. Let all the children of Israel, all the people of Judah, let them rise up. Let them pay attention. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm. Tell them, everything is not easy. Tell them, uh, some things are going to happen that both ears will tinkle. It says, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. It says that uh, the Lord has presented his mercy. And the Lord has presented his goodness. And the Lord has presented forgiveness. And the Lord has presented everything, every good thing that you can think about. But then it says, it will not go on forever. My spirit will not always plead with men, strive with men to bring them unto me. And therefore the time will come when the trumpet is blown and the whole land, the inhabitants of the land shall tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is near at hand. A day of darkness and a day of gloominess a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. Uh, already Joel was telling them, uh, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to have faithful ministers, that when the Lord sends something positive, you give it to the congregation. And when the Lord is warning of judgment to come, you give it to the congregation as well. And you do not allow yourself to feel that whatever you are receiving from the Lord, whatever passage you are reading from the Bible, you must always try to be positive. Joel couldn't change the message of the Lord to the people of Judah. He told them it will be a day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of the clouds, a day of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, it says a great people and a strong. There, there has not been ever the like, neither shall there be any after it just like that even to the years of many generations then he tell he told the children the people of judah he said a fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth uh, you see the picture here it says everything is green grass before they come everything is like the garden of eden before they come and as they are coming in their mighty army, it's like fire is burning before them. And then when they pass through, the flame will continue to burn behind them. And the fire before them burns now everything. And they trample on everything when they walk through. And then all the remnants of the stubbles that remain, the flame will consume after they are gone. It says the land is as the garden of Eden before them. And behind them, a desolate wilderness. Then it says, yea. It's an exclamation. It's a surprise. He saw it in the vision. He saw it coming. And he said, nothing shall escape them. Was it only Joel that spoke of something like this? This kind of devastation and destruction in the coming day of the Lord? No, actually. As you look at Isaiah, you see that other prophets too, they were faithful enough to say exactly what the Lord had given them to say. In Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6. How will ye scream, cry? How will ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint. 
and every man's heart shall melt. That is, uh, the strongest of the people of Judah, the strongest of the people of Israel, they will not know what to do when this devastation comes because all hands will, fa will be faint, will be weak. Every heart will melt. And then it says, and they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travels in labor pains. Then it says, they shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall gather and shall be as flames. Then it says, behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Uh, you see then, uh, the people that uh, are targeted for that day of the Lord, they are the people that uh, have rejected the mercy of God. They are the people that have rejected the forgiveness of the Lord. The people that have rejected the salvation of the Lord. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 46, all these prophets faithfully, they told the children of Israel, they told the people of Judah, that day is coming, that day is coming. It's called the day of the Lord, when God will bring everyone into account. Jeremiah now, chapter 46, I'm reading to you from the first part of verse 10. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. You see that uh, the Lord uh, will count uh, some people, those who have rejected the word of the Lord, he will count them as his adversaries. And then it says, it will be a day of vengeance, it's actually to visit judgment. Upon the people that have rejected the love of God, have rejected to walk in the way of the Lord, is the day of their visitation. Ezekiel chapter 30. Ezekiel chapter 30. I'm reading to you there from verse 1. The watch of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say. Thus says the Lord God, How ye scream and cry travail this thing coming is terrible woe was the day for the day is near even the day of the lord is near a cloudy day it shall be the time of the heathen here is telling us that the same thing that joel said is the same thing that isaiah said is the same thing that the lord gave unto ezekiel here we learn a great lesson it doesn't actually matter which location you are. There's a servant of God here. There's a servant of God there. There's a servant of God in another place. If the message is coming from God, the same God, the same message, the same emphasis. It doesn't matter the name of the denomination or the name of the church. The same Bible, the same way of righteousness, the same way of salvation, and the same warning that people should flee from the judgment to come. See how these uh, prophets were faithful. Uh, they were not looking to gather great crowds. They were not looking for cheap publicity. They were not looking to be famous. They were not looking for the praise of men. All they wanted was to faithfully declare the mind of God, the word of God, unto the people. And when God told them a devastation is coming, a destruction is coming, it's a day of gloomy darkness, they didn't change the message. They didn't try to make the people comfortable in their seats. They told them it's going to be a terrible time of suffering. And then in Amos chapter 5, this, this is graphic. The way Amos uh, relates his own, as the Lord gave it to him, and he's still talking about the same thing. He's still talking about the day of the Lord in Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5, reading there in verse 18. It says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Uh, Amos is, is so direct. And he's telling them that you people say, day of the Lord, day of the Lord, talking to the children of Israel. You do not know the description, the devastation, and the destruction that will come on that day of the Lord. And some people are saying, that's what we are waiting for. We are waiting for the day of the Lord. Let it come, and let it come quickly. And then Amos said, you don't understand the description and the things that will happen on the day of the Lord warned to you. Ye that desire the day of the Lord, to what end is it for you? For the day of the Lord is darkness 
and not lie. And then he said, uh, the reason why they were saying that, why they wanted this day of the Lord, is that already those people, they were suffering. And they were thinking, if the day of the Lord will come, even if, uh, you know, there's going to be suffering, the suffering cannot be as much as we're going through now. You know, that's what some people do. They think they are suffering. They have family problems. And they have some things that are kind of grinding them and crushing them. And they feel that, well, if I die, things will be better. Therefore, they commit suicide. And then they go to the other side. And they go to a more terrible suffering. And what they have seen here is like nothing compared with what they are going to see over there. That's what Amos was telling them. You think you are suffering now. You think you have any problem now. And then you are asking for the day of the Lord to come. Then he said in verse 19, As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him and or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent beat him. Here, you see what he's saying here. He's saying it's like a man is running from one trouble here. And he's saying, waiting for the day of the Lord. Let the day of the Lord come. And then Amos said, you don't understand. It's like a man running from this trouble, running from a lion. And as he escaped the lion, he got into what he called the day of the Lord. And a bear met him and still destroyed him. Or he went to the house thinking, it is too much trouble outside. And because I'm running from the trouble outside, let me go to my house. He got into the house, leaning his hand upon the wall. A serpent beat him and still caused pain and death. And that's why it says in verse 20, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? And so and that's what he's saying. And Sephaniah tells us, all these uh, prophets, uh, what they were warning uh, the, the people of Israel, telling them, what the day of the Lord will be. Sephaniah chapter 1. Sephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man, shall cry there bitterly. Here Sephaniah said, eh, there is no man so strong to be able to withstand that day. There is no man eh, that is so well controlled and well trained Pain never reaches him, never touches him. Whatever pain, whatever sickness, he can go through it without even showing on his face. Ah, he said, this one coming will be very different. It's a great day of the Lord, and it is very near, and it's hastening to come. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of weakness. And desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then it says in verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy reader, so he'll get rid of them, of all them that dwell in the land. Uh, you see then what he's saying, uh, talking about the day of the Lord. Now come on to the New Testament in First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 1, 2, and 3. First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Please understand. Here now, uh, Paul is talking to the Thessalonian believers of the day of the Lord. You understand these believers in Thessalonica? These believers, they were born again. These believers already, uh, they were waiting even for the Lord. Because he tells us in chapter 1 verse 10, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. From the wrath to come. Believers will not go through the wrath to come. But then he was uh, telling them something. He was saying, you are waiting for the coming of the Lord. And those people, uh, they were getting impatient. And do you see why they were impatient is? Here, Paul the apostle taught us when he came the other time that the Lord is going to come. He will take the saints away. We will not see corruption. And we which are alive is going to take us to heaven. And then some of them were dying. And they didn't understand why is it we have been waiting for the coming of the Lord. Then he told them in chapter 4, he said, But 
I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, as others which have no hope. You have hope, you are children of God. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the watch of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent precede them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another. With these words, the believers, we are waiting for the rapture because the Lord will come. Then he now told them, after the rapture has taken place and the children of God had been taken away, he said, of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Already the rapture has happened. He has spoken about the rapture in chapter 4. And he has said, comfort one another. Then it says that the day of the Lord will still come after the rapture. For when they shall say peace and safety. When their false prophets will be deceiving them. Say no problem. Don't listen to Joel. No problem. Don't listen to Ezekiel. No problem. Don't listen to Isaiah. No problem. Don't listen to Amos. That's nothing. And what are they talking about? Day of destruction. Day of darkness. Day of doom. Day of devastation. Day of gloominess. Don't listen to them. Those are prophets of doom. So there will be same peace and safety. Then it says, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. Unless the children of God will be afraid. He then said, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are children of God. You are born again. You are not waiting for that gloomy day. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Are you of the night? I said, Are you of darkness? Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, getting ready for the coming of the Lord our Lord Jesus Christ. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who of the day, be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, for an ailment, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to rust, but to obtain salvation of our Lord by our Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling us, yes, there's going to be the day of the Lord. There's going to be the day of destruction and devastation. But we, children of God, we are not for doom. We are not for destruction. We are not for damnation. We are for the coming of the Lord. And the Lord is coming. And when the Lord comes, he will take us home in Jesus' name. Then he says, if you have this hope in you, go to the Lord and get more grace. And as he adds grace upon grace upon grace in your life, you'll be ready for that day when the Lord will come. Will you be ready? I said, will you be ready? I pray the Lord will make every one of us ready. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. That will not have part in the day of gloom, in the day of darkness, will not have any part in the day of devastation that will come on that final day. You are a child of God. Hold on to the Lord. Don't be discouraged. Don't allow the devil to bring temptation your way, to dribble you, to make you fall. You have enough grace in the sight of the Lord. The Lord will hold you and keep you. He'll keep you. He'll keep you. Pray to thee and pray to the Lord that you will not fall and you will not fail. We don't know when the Lord will come for the church. Be ready. So that when it will come, you'll be a partaker in the rapture of the saints. Because the people that are left behind, they will go through that great tribulation. They will go through the terrifying, terrible, notable, great day of the Lord. Be ready when he comes for the church.